Um, now, my job this morning is to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Uh, Jeff Norris is a scientist from the Jet, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's fitting that we have robots bring us in because Jeff, he specializes in three things. One is robotics, second is software, engin software engineering, and the third is mission control for um, you know, a lot of the, uh, um, uh, the space missions. And, and you know, as, as I thought about this, I thought, man, he, he's, got the, he's got the dream job. You know, he, he actually controls, uh, sets up the missions for the robots on, on Mars and controls their, their operation. I thought, man, what a, what a fantastic, uh, fantastic job. I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, the, uh, his talk today is really about uh, agility. And agility in business and, and how to balance that with um, reliability of, of our systems. And uh, you know, I think he's a, he's a perfect choice to get this kicked off because we talk a lot about um, the fact that, that software you know, is, is continuous, it never stops. Um, seven, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, healthcare is always running and it's critical that these systems are, are always up and, and operational. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna finish talking. Jeff's gonna be much more interesting than I am. So I'd like to introduce Jeff Norris to the stage. Thank you. All right. And Jeff's gonna provide some great insight on how to continue to innovate and still balance reliability. So Jeff, turn it over to you. Thank you very much, wow. If I had known I was going to have that kind of an escort, I think I would have worn my Thor costume. <laughs> All right. Really happy to be here. I've got to say, one of the things that's nice about doing this occasionally is being around companies like yours that are really growing and vibrant and, from a technology perspective, really get what they're doing something that I find really energizing. And I'm hoping that I'm going to say a few things today that's going to make you want to disagree with me or come talk with me because I'd like to continue this dialogue all through the day. I'm going to be talking today about mission critical agility, or like he was saying, the importance of taking risks, and being agile, even when the consequences can be extremely serious. And I don't think I should have to tell you guys about that because like NASA, you guys are working in a field where the consequences of the wrong action can be serious, can be very severe. We have quite a lot of comment about that. But to start this conversation, actually, I'm going to tell some stories. In fact, the, my uh, presentation today is going to be a series of three stories. The reason I'm doing that is, is that I don't want to bore everybody here today with a super long list of agile do's and don'ts, because I'm sure you guys have seen that talk before. And frankly, I'm not an agile expert and not the right person to give you that talk. Instead, what I've found is that there's a few stories that when I studied them, they inspired me more than all those Agile books put together. And so the first story that I'm going to start off with, I'm going to start with uh, the birth of the Internet. And I'm not going to talk about Tim Berners-Lee or Vince Cerf, as you'll see. But just before that, there's one thing I wanted to show you guys, because I kind of stuck this in at the beginning. For some reason, I've been getting a lot of questions lately about what's NASA up to, right? You know, because some people saw we retired the space shuttle. Some people, I think, even get this feeling that we're not doing anything anymore. And so I want to just put that out of your mind right now because on August 5th, this thing, the Curiosity Mars rover will arrive at Mars just about 75 days or so from now. It's going to be arriving at three and a half miles per second, entering the Martian atmosphere, heating the heat shield up to bleed off as much of that entry velocity as possible. We've got to decelerate from tens of thousands of miles an hour down to zero in under eight minutes. That's why we call it eight minutes of terror. After we get done bleeding off as much of the speed as we can on the heat shield, piloting that ship the whole way, it's time to do something which looks a little bit normal. We're going to open up a parachute, but we're doing this at supersonic velocities. Can you imagine what an average parachute does if you're going faster than the speed of sound and you open it? Not that. Look this. It's about to get pretty crazy. Underneath that rover, underneath that back shell, you're seeing our rover fully exposed, and it's going to release itself from the back shell wearing what can only be described as a rocket-powered jetpack. Take that, Iron Man. 
It's going to hover itself down towards the ground. It's going to use a radar altimeter to sense the surface. It's going to arrest its horizontal velocity. And then, in case we weren't quite reaching that crazy bar yet, we're going to descend the rover underneath this hovering platform on a bridle, on a cable. Why are we doing this? We're doing it this way because this rover is the largest rover we've ever put on Mars. It is multiple times bigger than the Spirit and Opportunity rovers currently there. We're going to lower it on this bridle, release its landing gear here, which are its wheels, okay, and place it on its wheels on the surface of Mars. So I want you to imagine if you were standing on Mars right before this happened, there's nothing there. There's nothing. A few rocks, dust, right? Right after we do it, there's a rover sitting there. We fly this rocket propel platform off and it crashes someplace. <laughs> that on the rover, thank you. And there's our rover ready to do some science on Mars. This is what's happening within NASA. And this is real. And this is happening in just about a month and a half from now. Please, August 5th, I hope you'll be ready there to cheer with us. All right. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the birth of the internet now. <clears throat> and I'm doing that in order to talk about what I believe is the first of three qualities that are key pillars of an agile mindset, of thinking in this way that I'm trying to talk about today. And that's vision. The ability to see that which is not and to understand the impact that it's going to have on our world. My story of the internet begins in the quite unlikely place of a monk. This monk is standing in a field in France, 1792. And he's feeling a little bit confused because he's been called away from his morning prayers and asked to stand in this field mm -hmm. and hold two very heavy iron wires. He's further confused by the fact that all of his close friends, all the other monks from the monastery, are all standing out in this field with him, and they're all holding wires as well. In fact, they're holding the ends of each other's wires, and they make a, a giant loop of monks and wires, sort of like a, a monk network. He hasn't voiced his concerns until now because hmm. the person that's what? standing at the front and the end of this long line holding wires of his own is his boss, the abbot Jean-Antoine Nollet. But as abbot Nollet raises his wires hmm. over two very mm -hmm. ominous looking oh. jars and kind uh, well our friend can't keep his silence any further but to no avail because what he doesn't realize is that he is an unwitting participant in one of the first experiments in electricity and the abbot John Delay has learned two exciting things one of them is that because all the monks jumped and screamed at the same time that electricity travels very quickly and could be useful for communication. And the other thing he's learned is that if you're in a pinch, hmm. that a monk makes an excellent voltage detector. <laughs> now, it would take some time before the experiments of John Antoine Millet and his successors like Carl Goss and Baron von Schilling would give rise to an actual form of communication by electricity. But when Samuel Morse finally got there, and he's the least credited with creating the first commercially successful telegraph in the United States. I think he knew a little bit about what he had in his hand when he sent his first telegraph, which was, what hath God wrought? Big words. And I'm sure at the time he wasn't thinking about YouTube or wall cats. But nonetheless, I think if you think about what the telegraph was and what we're doing when we're texting and Twittering and instant messaging, that we're still, still sending telegraphs today. And at the time, this was an invention of remarkable vision and transformative impact on the world that it arrived in. But it had a problem. There was a monopoly. The Western Union Company controlled the telegraph industry. They had a problem too, which is that the telegraph could only send one message at a time. So forget bandwidth. Think about one message traveling in either direction at a time. That is the telegraph of the late 1800s and early 1900s. And this problem stuck around for a while. 
They had a plan to fix it, though. They made it known that any inventor who could fix this problem, who could have the vision to solve this for them, that they would make that person incredibly wealthy. Now, one of the inventors that got swept up in this craze was the hero of our first story about vision, Alexander Graham Bell, who I hope you all recognize as the inventor, again, of at least the first commercially successful telephone, but there were many other people working on it at the time. Now, it's important to note, boy, we have a lot of folklore about this guy now, but in the race to invent the multiple telegraph, that's a telegraph that can send multiple signals at a time, he was very much the dark horse, and he had stiff competition in the form of these types of people. Thomas Edison, already being known by this point as the Wizard of Menlo Park. Elisha Gray, directly funded by the Western Union Company. Alexander Graham Bell was not the one favored to win. And in case you have an impression on your mind of Alexander Graham Bell as being this well-to-do aristocrat who was experimenting with the telephone and some building on his grand estate, that is not Alexander Graham Bell. He is a dirt-poor immigrant who had to struggle very often to make enough money to find food to eat. But he had something that these two individuals did not. Next character in our story, who is Alexander Melville Bell, Alexander Graham Bell's father, an inventor in his own right. He created a system called visible speech. Visible speech is a way to teach deaf people to speak more effectively. And he did this in part because his wife, Alexander Graham Bell's father, I mean, sorry, mother, was also deaf. And so from a young age, the understanding of sound and hearing and the lack of hearing permeated the Bell household and Alexander Graham Bell's life and ultimately led him to his greatest invention. But before he could get there, he needed money. That was going to come from this guy, Gardner Hubbard, who also had a problem. He wanted to build his own telegraph company in the world of a monopoly the one run by Western Union, and I'm sure you guys can think of a few examples of how hard it is to start a company in the world with a controlling monopoly. The problem is, is that Gardner Hubbard has this little issue, which is that the Western Union Company has already scooped up all of the good inventors. So he's left to pick from what's left, and he meets this gentleman, Alexander Graham Bell, through his daughter, Mabel Hubbard, who is also deaf. And Alexander Graham Bell is making ends meet by teaching deaf people how to speak. But I've cheated a little bit here. This is not what Mabel Hubbard looked like when Alexander Graham Bell met her. She looked like this, which became something of a complication. The drama of Alexander Graham Bell's life at this moment is played out in a series of letters which have been faithfully preserved by the Library of Congress and which on your behalf I have poured over with great care. Now, why did I do this? I went looking for a story about a person who made the right choices and had vision in a mission-critical situation. And I'll get to rockets and spacecraft in a moment. That's one kind of mission criticality. But I'm telling the story to make a point, which is that mission criticality is about, and being agile in that situation, is about making the right decisions even when the consequences are dire. And so your mission-critical situation is not all that far from Alexander Graham Bell's mission-critical situation, and let me explain to you why. First, and I've, by the way, gone through these letters and transcribed parts of them, and if you look at the handwriting on some of these letters, this is basically one step away from encryption. So, um, <laughs> thankfully, a few of them have been transcribed already by historians, but I, I challenge you to read even two words on that screen. Anyway, um, these have been transcribed for you. First, we have Alexander Melville Bell writing to his son with great impatience because he has, ah, he's just had it with his son. He wants his son to bring his own invention, visible speech, to the world. He considers the multiple telegraph and this silly idea that Alexander Graham Bell's been thinking of called a telephone to be a total waste of time. Advises him to sell out and focus on what matters, which, of course, is what he cares about his own invention. Meanwhile, Alexander Graham Bell's sponsor, the guy with the money, is furious when he spends time on anything but the multiple telegraph. And we know that the drama between Alexander Graham Bell and his sponsor, Gardner Hubbard, played out in a series of very tense 
meetings at the Gardner Hubbard household. And I want you to imagine Alexander Graham Bell is the penitent inventor coming to his sponsor, trying to explain progress, trying to explain a lack of progress, desperately trying to convince him to give him more time, try to get him excited about this new idea, which is just taking over his psyche. And I want you to pay attention to this clue at the bottom. Bell said that. This is at a time when houses didn't have electric lights. You went to a fair to go and see a electric light. And he's talking about a time when we've all got telephones in our house chatting with people around the world. This is vision. Gardner Hubbard wasn't having it because at this point, he's even realized that Alexander Graham Bell has fallen in love with his daughter. And I couldn't make this up because what Gardner Hubbard does then is he tells Alexander Graham Bell that if he doesn't give up these flights of fancy, that he will never see his daughter again, he will never see the woman that he loves again. We know this because Mabel Bell wrote in her own letters that this is exactly what was going on. So pause and reflect for a moment on the mission criticality of this moment in Alexander Graham Bell's life. The desire to honor one's parents, to bring recognition to this labor that his father has devoted his life to. Riches, wealth, and status. Those lie on the path through Gardner Hubbard. And these are things that appeal greatly to Alexander Graham Bell. These are very important things to him. And then finally, the woman that he loves. All of these people are telling him to focus on anything except the telephone. What does he do? Increasingly, overwhelmingly, he can't ignore the promise of this invention. And as we know, he invents the telephone. He creates this and transforms our world with it. But we're not quite there yet. By the way, here he is holding his first model of the telephone. And he's holding it entirely incorrectly. And if you hold it this way, you're going to have signal loss. The manufacturer cannot be held responsible if you hold your phone this way. <laughs> now, it would be tempting right now to look at Alexander Graham Bell and think, this guy, he has superhuman vision, right? This is, this is not something we can compare ourselves to. But it's interesting to note that at least to some extent, he was laboring under a false supposition, which is that he had gotten a hold of a book by a German scientist named Himholtz. And when he read it, he thought, well, this is an important note, Alexander Graham Bell didn't speak German. So he was trying to puzzle the message in this book out by looking at the pictures and picking out a few words. And what he thought was that Hemholtz had figured out how to send vowels or parts of speech over a wire. And when Alexander Graham Bell read this, he thought, fantastic. Uh, if he can send vowels, well, all I've got to do is handle the consonants, and I'm going to have a working telephone. Hemholtz had done nothing of the kind. And for many years, Alexander Graham Bell lab labored to reproduce an experiment that had never been done. He ultimately did reproduce that experiment and build the telephone. And tells us even himself later that if he had known that Hemholtz had never done it, he probably wouldn't have even tried. Which I think is an important note about vision. Even somebody like this, who we honor with superhuman vision, it seems, did what he did in part because he thought it was possible, because he thought evidence had been provided that it was possible. The telephone, though, is still not this commercial success that we know today. And that's because Alexander Graham Bell lacked vision in one other critical area. There was an awesome opportunity for him. The Centennial Exposition, the World's Fair in Philadelphia, was the perfect place to unveil his telephone, to share it with the world. He couldn't be bothered to even go. He was busy. He had the working telephone, mind you. But he was probably trying to make a little bit of money again, teaching. Um, he's probably sick a bit because he worked himself almost to the point of death in order to invent the telephone. But for whatever reason, he just couldn't be bothered to go and visit. It took his wife, Mabel Bell, actually at, the mo at this moment his fiance, Mabel Hubbard, to have the vision to understand what had to happen next. And here's how the story goes. She told him, we're going to go on a drive today in our carriage in the countryside, her family's carriage. And so he said, all right, fine, you know, I'll be done with my classes. Come and pick me up. And so off they go. Before he knows it, he's standing at the train station 
with his bag in one hand, a ticket in the other, and his fiancée walking away from him. He protests, runs over to her and says, I can't, I can't do this. I can't go to Philadelphia. And she said, you must do this. This is the time. She turned her back. And if you remember, she's deaf. She reads lips. And so by turning her back is literally deaf to his complaints. He dejectedly turns, steps onto that train, goes to Philadelphia, unveils the telephone. It is shown to princes and kings. It becomes a world sensation. That is the moment that made Alexander Graham Bell the part of our folklore. Otherwise, he'd just be another guy who invented something, but who didn't get the credit for it. Something worth thinking about. Now I need to tell you about an extreme lack of vision. So we've had the vision of the inventor. We've had the vision of Mabel Bell. Now we're going to have the lack of vision of a gentleman named William Orton, the head of the Western Union Telegraph Company. So remember, they were trying to build the multiple telegraph. Their idea of innovation and vision was, we have a telegraph that sends one message, now we need a telegraph that sends two messages. Which, we can forgive them for that, that's, that was important, okay? Gardner Hubbard, that's the sponsor with the money, right? He gets cold feet after Alexander Graham Bell has invented the telephone. He's unsure about what the commercial prospects of this thing are. He goes to William Orton and says, I'm gonna sell you the telephone. He brings the working telephone and the patents and says, you can have all of this, scot-free, all the rights to it, for a sum that in today's dollars was $5 million. For $5 million, William Orton was owned, was offered the telephone and all the things that would come after it. He turned it down. And in doing so, became known not as the head of a remarkably powerful company, but perhaps his lasting legacy is making one of the worst business decisions ever made. And so, by the way, it's hard to know exactly what he said in that closed door meeting, but he is often quoted as saying, what use would my company have with this electrical toy? That is a lack of vision. Now, wrapping this story up, the first of our three stories today, I want to talk about the different kinds of vision we saw there. There's the vision of the inventor, which is easy to recognize. We all want to be like Alexander Graham Bell, to be able to have that kind of vision. Fortunately for all of us, that is not the only kind of vision necessary for success. Alexander Graham Bell needed the vision of other individuals. I'll point out that Gardner Hubbard, though he did resist and at times fight Alexander Graham Bell's invention of the telephone, he nonetheless ultimately did tolerate this exploration into the margin of what the supposed goal was. I think this is an important lesson for those of us who manage teams of innovators to understand that yes, the goal is important, but sometimes the true advance lies in the margin of what it was you set out to do in the first place. Alexander Melville Bell had vision as well, that's the father, but in a narrow and focused direction, but we'll forgive him for that. And then, as I mentioned, Mabel Bell providing the last piece of this puzzle, the kind of vision that recognizes the moment, the venue for the unveiling, for the release of an idea to its market. Now, it might be easy to say, that's the stuff of legends. There aren't those kinds of people around today. And whatever you think of these two gentlemen, I disagree. These are the visionaries of today, and I'll point that out in two ways. One, yes, they had vision and showed it in their work. They also surrounded themselves, in Zuckerberg's case, continued to surround himself with people that provide the other pieces of vision necessary to build the things that we all associate them with today. I could talk all day about Alexander Graham Bell, but I have to make one last point for you, and then we're going to go on to our next story. What you see along the top row there is an evolution of the telephone from the first Bell telephone to really what was the last Bell telephone, okay? And that spans a few decades there, you know, from Bell's phone to this rotary thing to the grand advancement of buttons instead of a dial. Then what happened? Motorola arrived. Motorola completely disrupted the market that Bell, Western Digital, a few others, had thought that they owned. And for about 10, 15 years, Western Digital completely owned the mobile telephone market. 
And I think you see why I'm putting this on a second line. It is a complete disruption of what came before it. What happened next? Motorola got their lunch, their lunch eaten. And this wasn't too long ago. This is about you know, eight years ago, where Motorola from went from a completely controlling position in the cell phone market and the mobile phone market to a point of they were so <laughs> decimated that their parent company recently j just sold them off, and they're, they're desperately trying to, to remain relevant in this world, thanks to people like RIM and others. So I left this sentence incomplete up here because I want to ask you what's going to finish that sentence, and please don't tell me that it's just a white one. <laughs> we know it's not, right? And we know there's another line under this, right? And we hope an infinite number of lines that follow that. It's not obvious right now what that next line is going to be, is it? That's the kind of vision, I think, that Alexander Graham Bell had to see what the next line was on this graph. Now, if you're as captivated as I am with the story of Alexander Graham Bell's life, I strongly recommend this book. It's where some of the research for the talk came from. I could only cover a really small bit of his life. And if there's one thing I learned in researching this and other stories, it's that what we're taught about a person like this is just the barest minimum of what actually happened. This was a real person with a real life responding to pressures that I'm sure that all of you would identify with very well. But we have to go on to our second story today, a story about what I feel is the second pillar of an agile mindset, which is risk, the willingness to take risks. Now, I work for NASA. Risk is a big deal to us. We do very risky things. It pervades our culture. We manage it. We trade it, just like we do other currencies on our project, like schedule, like budget. I don't think I have to tell you this. I don't know a lot about the way your company works, but I'm hoping today to learn a little bit more. And I bet that this is something that's on your minds a lot, too. And it can be hard when you're facing risks, when you're facing a situation where you feel you cannot fail, to take risks anyway. But to that way lies ruin as I will mention, explain here. Now, at no point in the history of the agency that I work for did we more palpably feel the sensation of risk than in this moment. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Now, it's funny that John F. Kennedy kind of left out the part of how it was we were going to do that. He just said we're going to the moon, right? So. It's odd, but it almost seems like some of the early ideas for how to do that came from this movie, which was in 1958, Destination Moon, which is a quite charming little story about going to the moon. And if you were to ask your five or six year old, how would we go to the moon? They would probably describe something like this movie, which is, well, mommy, daddy, I would build a giant rocket. How big, honey? Huge. And I would launch it to the moon. And and, oh, then what, honey? Oh, I would land on the moon, and, and then I would get out and get back in and fly the big rocket back. Can I go play now? Well, it sounds funny to us now, but that's pretty much what the original design for Apollo was. It's called the direct ascent method. And basically, it said, we're going to build a giant rocket, a rocket breathtakingly huge, called the Nova, even larger than the Saturn V, which we ultimately used for the mission. And as a quick digression, the Saturn V, the rocket that ultimately launched Apollo, at the time that it was launched, was the tallest building in Florida. Okay, technically, the only bigger building was the one that held the Saturn V, but the Saturn V got rolled down a road on wheels and then launched into space. They launched the tallest building in Florida into space. <laughs> Sound a little bit risky? But the Nova rocket was going to be even bigger. And it had to be huge because the thing that was stuck on top of it was six stories tall. And that was because it had to be everything. You can think of it sort of like the Battlestar Galactica method for going to the moon. It was the spacecraft that handled the launch. It was the spacecraft that flew to the moon, it's the spacecraft that landed on the moon, that took back off from the moon, that flew back and did entry and descent and landing. It did everything. So it had to be everything, it had to be enormous, and ultimately was too large, too big to succeed. But it was endorsed 
by some very important and powerful people, including this gentleman, Werner von Braun. This is not a person that you disagreed with lightly. He endorsed the direct ascent method and said that this was the way we were going to do it. But there was a small and vocal minority led by this gentleman, the hero of our second story, John C. Havelt. He had a very different idea about how we were going to go to the moon. He said, instead of a giant rocket, we're going to build a four-part spacecraft, which is going to reconfigure multiple times on the way to the moon and on the way back in order to accomplish the mission. And even by today's standards, this sounds like science fiction. Imagine what it sounded like in 1960. Now, here's John explaining his idea, I think quite eloquently using this amazing technology called a chalkboard. Um, and I'm going to explain that mission to you as well. But rather than using uh, the tried and true method of a chalkboard, which couldn't possibly fail while I'm standing in front of a thousand people, um, I'm going to use a bunch of technologies that are rolled together and uh, which I think make this message a lot more fun because, well, for one thing, I'm talking about risk right now. I don't know how seriously you guys would take me if I didn't take a few risks of my own. And second, I just sometimes feel that risk, risk can be its own reward at times. So let's get started here. You want to go from there to there. And that's pretty hard to do. Those things are pretty far from each other. And we've already ruled out this Battlestar Galactica direct ascent method. So let's go the complete opposite direction and ask ourselves, what is the absolute smallest thing that you could possibly cram three astronauts inside? That would be this, the Apollo command module, which is really a minimalist design in spacecraft. That thing is a tin can with enough room for three people, some gases, and not a whole lot more. It has one door on it. You can see there on the top, the astronauts climb in that thing one time at the beginning and climb out of it one time at the very end. But as you can see, that thing by itself is not going anywhere. It's kind of missing a rather important part, wouldn't you agree? An engine? Uh, so that's going to come from this, which is the Apollo service module. Now we're talking about a real rocket ship. It docks on the back of the command module like that. Now, in case you're thinking that suddenly they've got a lot more room, this whole service module thing back here, it's uh, full of consumables and equipment and things like that. There's no pressurization back there. The astronauts are still confined to the cheap seats up there in front. But at least now, this thing could go somewhere, right? We've got a rocket engine on it. It doesn't look too different from something that our kids might draw if they wanted to go to the moon. Um, but that thing can't land on the moon. To do that, we're going to need one of these, which is the Lunar Excursion Module, or LEM. Now we're talking about a real spacecraft with all the hard edges all of the angular parts of this thing, this thing would just melt if you put it into the atmosphere. Um, but it's quite well designed for the low gravity environment of the moon and quite suited to, to that environment. So it gets docked for launch right there. Now I want us to pause for just a second and imagine how John Hubble's presentation is going right about now because the guy in front of him said, yeah, I got an idea how we're going to go to the moon. We're going to build a giant rocket. We're going to launch it to the moon. Then we're going to launch it back again. Any questions? And this is what John is showing them. And I'm betting at this moment, people in the room are starting to fidget a little bit, look a little bit uncomfortable and say, you know, John, it's really great that you've uh, made this presentation to us today. But, you know, uh, me and the guys were talking and, you know, that, that rocket engine part that you were just talking about right there, we think if you turn that on, it's not going to be really good for this part back here. <laughs> and John says, oh, uh, yeah, of course, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, we're going to um, just swing this whole thing around like this after we launch and dock it right back to the limb like that in space. <laughs> <sighs> the 
they let him keep going. And it's a good thing because there was, <laughs> there was some good parts to come. So now we have the con cruise configuration of the Apollo spacecraft. This is how it went to the moon. So if you'll permit me, just a little bit of theater here. We're at Earth, which we see receding into the distance. Try that again. Receding into the distance. And we arrive at the moon. Okay. Um, but we're not done yet because, as we mentioned a second ago, this whole thing, it, it can't go down to the moon. It's um, a little bit too complicated to do that. So the next thing we're going to do is two astronauts are going to climb from the command module here into the, the limb over there. And one guy gets to stay behind in the uh, command module and orbit the moon and do science, which you have to kind of agree is a little bit of a letdown. <laughs> anyway, because the, the other guys, you see, this guy goes off and does science, and these guys get to pilot the sports car down to the surface of the moon with the billion people watching him and land it, get out, walk around on the surface of the moon, pick up some rocks, hit a few golf balls, climb back in, and we're not done with the crazy stuff yet because now the spacecraft is going to break in half. So this part is going to stay on the moon, and this part is going to fly back up into orbit again. So they fly back into orbit around the moon again and look around for a little while until they find the... Uh, they were a little more careful than that. Uh, until they find the command module, service module here, and then they redock to it in lunar orbit. And these guys get back into the command module with the guy they left behind. How's it been? Kind of boring. We brought you a rock. <laughs> anyway, they're done with this thing now. Uh, they don't need to take this all the way back to Earth again, so they release this, and it falls and crashes into the moon and makes a giant hole for science. They literally did that. They crashed the, the limb top back into the moon to make a big explosion. That's what I would have done. Anyway, um, so they are back inside this thing again. So they turn this thing back towards Earth. More theater, the moon receding in the distance, and the Earth arriving. We're still not quite done yet because at this point, we're going to detach the service module. That's the part with the engine. And I don't know about you, but if someone tells me that at this point in the mission, I'm going to drop my engine, and it's going to be fine, I would be a little bit confused, but they did it. Wow. They leave their engine behind, and now this is all they've got left from the tallest building in Florida to that, with three very scared astronauts packed inside. It orbits just a bit, comes down to the surface of the Earth, splashes down in the ocean, and three astronauts climb out, very thankful to be alive. The end. Let me bring all that back for you. So when you look at that, that does not look like a safe thing to do. That looks like a very risky thing to do, but it turns out this was the defining moment of the Apollo mission. We now know with the benefit of lots of historians, with modern science and technology, we can look back at the decisions that were made and realize that if they had not changed architectures to this approach to going to the moon, we would not have gotten to the moon in a decade, quite possibly wouldn't have gotten there at all. And so the thing that at face value appeared to be extremely innovative, different, challenging, in a high stakes business was the right thing to do. It was the only way to get there. It wasn't quite official yet though, and so take us back here for a second. to this gentleman. So, you recall, Werner von Braun had publicly opposed 
the alternatives to the direct ascent method. He now did something that I think was really quite remarkable. He reversed his position. After seeing John Halbold's argument, after understanding the case for what he was proposing, he publicly endorsed the lunar orbit rendezvous method, John Halbold's method. And I have a lot of respect for someone who can do that, because here is the big dog. Here is the guy who's supposed to have the vision for the future. Publicly endorsed another way of doing things, and now he's reversing his position and supporting the alternative offered by somebody else, something that had been quite unpopular. I think there's a great lesson in that. I think it differs quite sharply with the lack of vision and also the lack of risk-taking shown by William Orton, head of Western Union, that we discussed earlier. So, to sort of sum up our second story here, I'm going to appeal to a quote that I hope is familiar to many of you working in software. But I want to point out the sort of trap that's in this quote. So, we're often told that to be agile, to work this way, we should do the simplest thing that we can, right? That's really kind of a misquote, isn't it? Because what Ward Cunningham actually said was to do the simplest thing that could possibly work, and it is in discovering that that we find the appropriate amount of risk to take, the right amount of in innovation in a risky situation, doing the simplest thing that could possibly work. I could also talk about Apollo all day, but we have to go on again because I have one more story to tell you, one more point here to make, which is about the third pillar, I believe, of an agile mindset, and that is commitment or actually deferred commitment, because I'm really going to talk about the art of remaining uncommitted and reserving your critical investment as long as possible. And to explain this story, I'm going to turn to I, who I believe is the grand master of deferred commitment, which is Gloriana, Queen Elizabeth I of England. She came to power in a precarious time. Her rule was very uncertain. If you look at what happened to her predecessor, beheaded, her father, Henry VIII, how many heads did that guy chop off? Her rule would be consolidated and secured, at least by conventional wisdom, by taking a husband as quickly as possible. A husband could provide her an heir, thus providing solidity and permanence to her reign. A husband could bring an alliance with a foreign power, that otherwise threatens England. This was a time of great danger for England. His, her closest advisors are all advising her to take a husband as quickly as possible. In fact, this becomes a topic of great debate in Parliament. Imagine for a moment if the marital habits of our president were discussed in Congress. Oh, wait. I guess they did that already. So, anyway. Um, anyway, Queen Elizabeth was furious with this, but... She delayed nonetheless, and it wasn't because she didn't have any lack of options. There were dozens of suitors, princes, kings, dukes, people with incredible amounts of wealth and power and very, very silly shirt collars. <laughs> and all these people would have been a fine option for Queen Elizabeth, but she didn't just turn them all down. No, she extended their courtships, all of them drew them out, played them against each other, sometimes rejected one, only to later invite him back again and give him another try. Now, conventional wisdom says if you've got a hard decision to make, you begin by eliminating options, eliminating options, carving down to the finalists and then making a choice. That is exactly not what Queen Elizabeth did. She seemed to be taking actions to increase her options, to maximize her options. What was this woman up to? She was deferring commitment, and here's why. She understood that her reign was precarious without a husband, but she also understood that a suitor does not invade your country or attempt to assassinate you. Neither does that matter, we hope at least, in most cases. Neither does a husband, but... Queen Elizabeth could have many suitors, but only one husband. 
And so by doing so, she could maintain alliances, somewhat shaky perhaps, with many, many different suitors for a long period of time. This was very artful. Now, ultimately, for those familiar with the story, of course, she turned them all down, and she found a way to accomplish her goals without any of them. <laughs> she took her time, though. In fact, she waited to name her heir, James I, her first cousin once removed, now the king of Scotland, until she was just about to die, okay? Now, this guy, by this point, had already proven himself to be a very capable ruler of Scotland. He'd been king for a while. And he also had the requisite extremely silly shirt collar. <laughs> so in a way, I think Queen Elizabeth cheated. Because not only did she draw out those courtships as long as possible, she waited to name an heir until she saw which of her familiar relations actually turned out to be a decent ruler. You could say it was vision, but it's not. It's the opposite of that. It's artfully playing the game and waiting to make your critical decision until the decision is practically obvious. Well, pick the guy who's a king already, and he doesn't seem to be making anybody too unhappy. Well, that seems like a good choice, doesn't it? As opposed to, well, we're going to pick this four-year-old nephew of mine, and gosh, I hope he doesn't turn up to be a jerk. So Queen Elizabeth won that game through deferred commitment. And we have to agree, she also won the game of most ridiculous collar. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> now look, I know that in our businesses, in my world, in your world, we're working on projects that often look like this. A lot of options laid out in front of us, and we desperately want to try to make the right choice. And it doesn't help, by the way, that there are people screaming in our ears about the danger of picking the wrong option, right? Well, if you pick that option and you're wrong, you could bankrupt the company, you could kill a patient, you could do something awful, right? That rings in our ears. People are great at that, reminding us about that. Interesting to me, though, is that they're not so good about reminding us about when the right time it is to make a choice. We all wish that we had this kind of vision. Like all those doors disappear and see just the one. Just the one that is the right choice. The right option to make. We think that inventors like Graham Bell or people like John C. Howbold had that kind of, of ability. They don't. I really don't believe that's true. I believe that they instead have the ability to see many options at once. And here's why. Now, Common wisdom of agile principles would say that the right thing to do to be agile is to be courageous. Pick that option and charge through it, right? Courage. That's one of the like, core principles in those books you might read. Interestingly enough, this is the least agile thing that you could do. Because if you make a choice and commit yourself and rush headlong into it, you are now without options. And if you did that too soon, you squander those options for nothing. This is what you want to do. You want to survey the options ahead of you, keep as many of them available to you as long as you possibly can, hold back your critical investment until the moment that it makes the most sense. We do this in my work. I bet you do it too. And the way that I can sum it up in my work is that we've replaced this question, which everybody likes to ask, right? I've got a problem. How can I solve this problem? How can I build this thing? I think a great way to defer your commitment is actually to ask this question. How can I avoid building this thing? This is where things like open source can make an enormous transformative difference. Because if you can find a way to rely on the investment of others for parts of the system that you're building and reserve the part that you care most deeply about for the right moment, then you have deferred commitment and you're much closer to success. I mentioned before that I don't think that Alexander Graham Bell and the other heroes of the story had that ability, that ability to pick that door out from all those options. I don't actually have to speculate about that because they tell us that. They tell us that they didn't work that way. Being agile, being having vision, taking risks, deferring commitment, 
these are an art of working that doesn't require this superhuman clairvoyance that we often think that it does. So I'm going to leave you with one last quote from Alexander Graham Bell, which I think is pretty fitting for the event that you're here today. These events are awesome. You should, by the way, be really glad that your company has the vision to have something like this, because not all of them do. Because at events like this, when you bring people together who care deeply, passionately about the same sorts of things, and they start exchanging notes and learning things, great, amazing things happen. But only, I think, if you can approach an event like this with the right mindset, which is you've got to come with an open mind and a willingness to leave the beaten path, learn something new, try something different, have a conversation that you wouldn't ordinarily have. If you do that, I think you're going to get a great deal out of this event. And I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? That or I'll repeat your question for you. All right, now you know what I feel like. <laughs> they loved it. They, we typically, now there's going to be some questions here. Now we, uh, we typically throw balls into the crowd to make them come forward. That's what I do. I'm glad it's a ball, not something sharp. Yeah, we could bring, bring Iron Man back <laughs> if we don't have a question. Um, now I, I have a question for you. Sure. So what was... Um, yeah, what was the most exciting NASA project that you've worked on? I mean, what was the most challenging thing you've done? Well, I don't have to think too hard about that. So the, the defining point for my career so far at NASA uh, was definitely the landing of the Spirit and Opportunity Mars rovers. So I, I feel a special connection to that mission because uh, when I came to JPL, I started working on the technology precursors of that mission. So all of the test vehicles and the software that we would use to control those test vehicles. And, you know, got to know the science team members when they were just, you know, trying to get onto a mission. And then worked with them all through the development of that mission and then uh, got to be part of the operations team for the mission. And so, for me, the most thrilling and frightening moment was sitting on console on landing day for the Spirit rover, the first one to land. And sitting in front of the software that I had led and preparing to open up the first images from Mars. And there's two words going through my, two things going through my mind at this moment, of course. One of them is, oh my God, what are we going to see, right? You know, because we have no idea. We're landing at a space on Mars we've never been to before. It could be anything in front of us, right? The other thing that's going through my mind is, oh my God, I hope my software doesn't break right now. <laughs> right, so that, it didn't, by the way, it opened in, wow, that was, I'm never going to forget that moment. But um, that was probably the point where all of my excitement, all of my hopes, and all my fears professionally speaking, came in together in one instant, and I'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, when I opened the, um, when I introduced you, I said, uh, yeah, you have the dream job, and I actually believe it now. I mean, uh, those are awesome stories. Um, maybe you can give us uh, a little inside information. Was there ever a point that you, you got in trouble, the, you thought the, uh, the rover was going to fail, got stuck in a ditch somewhere. We get in trouble um, all the time. No, it's, if, if we've somehow given the impression that space exploration is easy, I apologize. <laughs> it is not. Um, August 5th, right? Super exciting day for us. Absolutely terrifying day as well. Entry, descent, and landing on Mars is the, one of the hardest things that we do. And uh, we do everything we can to reduce the, the risk as low as possible. But Let's face it, there is a finite risk that that rover is going to make a big hole in the ground. And, you know, we hope very much, we prepared as well as we can, but we, no one's ever been to Mars. And by the way, I should mention that all that stuff you saw in that intro video, it all happens completely autonomously. A 10 to 20 minute time delay by the speed of light to Mars, meaning that by the time we hear the first thing about the entry, descent, and landing, it is already over, okay? So it's not like at that moment we could say, I'm going manual and like try to bring it in, right? <laughs> yeah. It is already a hole on the ground or a very happy rover waiting to try it. So, look, uh, there have been lots of times when on my projects we've gotten you know, in trouble, we've been 
you know, we've faced budget cuts, we've faced uh, losing key people on the team, we've faced um, things we were depending upon, th key third-party technologies going belly up on us. I'm sure I'm telling you guys things that you have all gone through probably last week, right? So this is, th we're, we're not so far apart, I think, in, in the pressures we face. Hi. Um, I'm going to ask you for another story, sort of along the lines of that intro video. Um, so I'm sure that in the history of the rovers that have gone to Mars, there's been a lot of discussion on how we stop and delicately land this remote controlled expensive RV. So how did you, and maybe you can, you know, draw analogies to your talk about how you came up with this landing process for this new rover versus some of the old techniques that were done for the earlier rovers? Sure. Um, that is something I cannot take any credit for, just to be clear. So uh, one of the really fun things about my job is I work in a highly multidisciplinary field. Um, I'm a computer scientist. Obviously, you don't want a computer scientist trying to, to do that. Um, the, uh, so the people who are responsible for entry, descent, and landing at JPL, you know, lots of mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, et cetera, they came up with that landing approach. Um, I can still tell you several things about why, why it has to be like that, because we get a question frequently, why didn't we just do it the way we did it before, right? The bouncing airbag thing, if you guys have ever seen that video. Um, it worked, right? Yeah, well, it worked. Uh, we have nothing particularly against doing something twice at NASA. Um, it's just that we're rarely asked to do anything twice. And of course, I'll admit it, we kind of like that. But the, the issue here was, you know, the science community could have told us, play it again, Sam, send an, another rover of the same kind to a new place on Mars. Because, guys, let's face it, we put two Viking landers, one Pathfinder lander, two Mars rovers, and one Phoenix spacecraft, so we're up to six there, spacecraft onto the surface of Mars. Mars has as much land as Earth, okay? So if you've explored six places on Earth, and none of those spaces is bigger than, than a few tens of kilometers, which is how far the rovers can drive, you would not be done, right, going to, to, to Earth. So uh, it's not that. It's that they came up with an ambitious science payload that was heavy, massive, and the old landing method simply wouldn't work. We also wanted to get more accurate with our landings because, not commonly known, the landing ellipse, that's the area of uncertainty for the old landing technology, is larger than the distance that the rover can drive. So think about that for a second. That means you can't actually pick a spot on Mars and say, we're going there, and then land and drive there. The new landing technology has a landing ellipse which is smaller than the drive capacity of the rover, meaning that we can pick a spot on Mars and say, we're going there. Right? So it's more accurate, it can land a way heavier vehicle, but it doesn't make it any less scary. And so as far as where that spark of innovation for them came from, that's not something I feel like I could answer adequately, but I'm very impressed. I hope as impressed as you guys are with the approach that they chose. Yeah. Hey, um, so since the space race is over and there's been a kind of a dip in interest in exploration and so forth, I'm sure you guys at NASA know this. Uh, what would you say to the sort of people who are telling you that maybe you're doing exactly what you're saying there, which is doing something that you can't avoid doing? What's the good that comes out of the whole space exploration thing? What's, Could you repeat that last part, that we're doing something that? Like you said, you know, a smart person doesn't th say, hey, how can we solve this problem? It's, should we avoid solving this problem altogether? Yeah, yeah, OK. So what would you say? Um, are the benefits of solving this one? Well, so yeah, I mean, I read the papers too, but we can, we can thank the uh, media, of course, by, for over sensationalizing everything, and NASA's no exception. So yeah, NASA, um, I mean, we retired the space shuttle, which we're really gratified, by the way, that everybody is so emotionally attached to the space shuttle that merely moving on to new launch vehicles would cause people to say, you know, oh my gosh, the space industry is over. But, uh, it certainly isn't. In fact, I mean, I hope you guys were following the news this past week where SpaceX successfully docked the Dragon capsule to the space station. Um, sometimes people ask me, by the way, oh, you know, are you upset about the competition with the commercial space sector? And it's funny because we're paying them. <laughs> I mean, if we're trying to com compete with the commercial space industry, we're doing a really dumb thing right now, which is that <laughs> we are funding the private space industry. So. Um, actually, we're thrilled about it, and NASA has always been its bit in the business of doing something Extension only as long as it takes before somebody else can do it and hopefully make money off of it, because then we can go do the thing that's too, 
crazy, too apparently stupid to make any money, right? That's what we're supposed to do. So as soon as we can get out of the space taxi business, the better, right? Now, as far as the essential, you know, how essential it is to explore, I hope that everyone here, and if not, I'll try to convince you, and I can try to convince you in a later conversation as well, would agree that a part of every great civilization, as long as there have been civilizations, is exploration. Okay? That is what great civilizations do. It's, civilization, it's what great companies do, for that matter. Companies are civilizations that turn inwards, that decide, you know what, our border is big enough, we've innovated enough, we've looked far enough, that's the beginning of the end for them. So what can you do about it, by the way, is you can tell people, your friends, you can tell your Congress people, whatnot, that exploration is still important to us. Now, to be fair, they agree, and the NASA budget is the same as it's been last year, and it's the same as it's been the year before. You know, we have plenty of money to keep exploring. It's uh, really just that we're switching launch vehicles, guys. So anyway, I hope that answers the question. Okay, Ryan. You're the last question, so make okay. this a good one. Okay. okay. Uh, better be a good one then, I guess. Uh, uh, can you share your thoughts on how we, we could create an environment in which someone feels like they can challenge Werner von Braun's rocket design? That's a good one. Okay. So, <laughs> well, first thing, um, I'm, I believe there, there, there are a lot of engineers here. There ought to. I'm sure there's some leaders here as well, people who are leading engineers, leading uh, projects, leading modules, et cetera. Uh, the first thing I would say is that a, a, a company that's going to make it, if you will, has got to encourage, develop, and promote the kind of leader that allows and supports what Werner von Braun did, meaning that the, the recognition that the goal is important, but the simultaneous recognition that we've got to keep our eyes open for the different way of doing business, the different way, the disruptive way of doing business, even though you feel like you're in this position where you own the market, you control the market, and you don't, you know, you don't want to mess it up, right? So I guess the first thing I would say is I hope your company already does, and if not, then the leaders among you should be trying to build a culture in where this is true, which is that your leaders are not about status quo. That's that's a real recipe for a problem. Your leaders are about balancing risk and innovation. They need to have that judgment to decide when innovation takes the day. So that's the best thing I could offer there. But boy, if you can crack that problem, I'd really like to know the answer to it. So something we struggle with as well. OK, great answer. Well, thank you, Jeff. Let's give Jeff another round of applause. Thank you. Good job. Appreciate it.